I said that just so Dick would respond. I don't have any weaver jokes tonight. So. <laughs> like the balloon festival, if you've never been, it's a really good thing to do. I think you're wanting to go to Fish Island. Talk to the to the electric books out there. But back to it. Uh, I've been to Africa seven times. Uh, I've been to most of the countries. I haven't spent a lot of time in South Africa. I usually go to Botswana. Or Tanzania, those are my two favorite countries there. I still have a great time. Where are you going? Who's your outfitter? It's actually a screenwriters um, conference okay. that they're having there. So um, I, can't, I know the name of the, the group of white that's taking the resort. Going to parts, you'll have to do it. Yeah, yeah, we're, it's, it's, in a resort, it's a resort. It's a whole. It's, it's actually, yeah, the, the conference is. The screenwriting. Okay. The screenwriting conference. She gets. She's going to talk tonight. There was a. There was a gal a couple of years ago that thought she'd just rent a car and drive into the park. Uh, and, 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 and she was eating literally. Oh, so you, you really need to go with a guy. Yeah, yeah, it's really good resort. Yeah, they'll be daily. Does I think every morning they go for like their trip in the morning, fresh flowers, and then. Okay, sounds like it's going to be real, real good and cool. Uh, I blame John for the topic because it's a little dry, but we'll try to spice it up. But I'm just joking. That's what I was in demand to talk about storage. Uh, I keep torturing you with this picture of the leopard I took because it's reasons we are meticulous with our backup and our storage is so we can have this picture. We can have it. This is probably five years ago. And in 10 years, I can still pull up the image. And when there's a new technique, a new filter, or a new whatever, uh, you still have the raw image and you can play with it. So we spend time and money and effort to keep the image so we can look at it later, so we can show it uh, to people later also. You see on there where you keep seeing this? Play. Is that play there or play here? Uh, I, I think if you just hit play. Or just the play here. It'll go. There you go. Uh, I do mostly wildlife photography. I, it's just something that I fell into. My wife and I were traveling here to go. We were traveling down the coast of California. We saw a sign up that said, the uh, elephant seals are on the beach. And I mostly, I think that sign was a warning, just to tell you. <laughs> but not honestly, we went to the beach. And when we drove through the ranger station, I asked the ranger uh, where the wall is. And he kind of glared at me and the elephant seals are over there, don't get too close. Well, I fell in love with photographing animals when I saw the seals. Uh, as you know, they're huge and they weigh the females are only a thousand pounds of females at a time. And they like to fight and play. And that's where my interest started right there. We started planning our travel stuff around going places. We've been to both poles, been to Africa several times, India. We just came back from the Galapagos and we're going to Borneo to shoot. Oh, Everybody know what Borneo is? Nice. <laughs> and I usually pick out the animal. Of course, Borneo is the orangutan. So I pick out an animal, my wife goes on the map and says it's here, and we go there. So this was, uh, the leopard was Botswana. Uh, next. I'll talk a little bit about how I archive, store, save images. And then I'm gonna ask you all how you do it, because there's no right or wrong way to do this. Most of you all, even though you don't know it, you probably have a workflow. You come in with your photos, you put them somewhere, you save them. You, put them up in the cloud, which I don't use, but we'll talk about that. But there's a process you do in order to ensure that the pictures are there later. So then I'll get your ideas for storage. And then I've got a few photos of the Galapagos that I'll, I'll share at the end. That was my first computer. <laughs> Mac 512. It cost a small fortune. And I never thought I'd ever get another computer. Had a 512k floppy drive. 
that also ran the operating system. So you had to do floppy swap. Remember floppy swap? <laughs> if you were really, really good, you had another external floppy dodge. So you could run the operating system and have your data dodge. And, and that was 512K, which I don't think I've seen many files that small anymore. <laughs> but the operating system ran on the floppy. We swapped, as you know, those disks only held 1.4 megabytes. And sometime down the road, I actually invested in a 10 megabyte hard drive, external hard drive, 10 megabytes, can you imagine the output? And I, I thought, no way I'm ever gonna, and I think these are in museums now, because, uh, where they've gone to. And of course, photography and computers haven't really gotten together yet. I mean, Photoshop may have been in its infancy, but uh, I don't think they even had color monitors then. But most of us were shooting 35 millimeter film where we had 24 to 36 images per roll. And we had to take our pictures conserving that film because we knew we just have a roll of film. And I think there was a couple of situations that in the Galapagos recent where I held the shutter down and took 36 <laughs> images at one time. So that's changed, but we had to budget then. And we don't budget now. We turn the thing up and pull the button down. Even if we're not doing wildlife, even if we're scenery, we'll put a couple we're on the tripod, we might do an HDR exposure. You know, we're all, we all take a bunch of images because we think they're free, but we'll talk about how they're not free. <laughs> when I went to college, I, of course, I walked in the first day with the camera around my neck and the school newspaper said, <laughs> pointed to me. But the good thing about that is I got taught darkroom and I got to use all their equipment, uh, which included a, this Nikon camera with the two big reels on either side that held 250 <clears throat> image rolls of film. And it had a motor drive. Remember those big motor drives used to the, to the bottom of the camera? And you got to go to sport events to take, you know, 30 feet of, of film that you got to, of course, develop and print. But if you just come into photography now and get into Photoshop or Lightroom, you miss all that. And that's really a good root basis, I think. If there are young photographers in the crowd, take a darkroom class. Just go to the Pensacola State, take one of the adult classes on darkroom. It'll, it'll make you a better photographer, just learn how to print and develop black and white film. So we don't use the darkroom anymore. Uh, this was 84 when I bought this computer. Data doubles every two years, and that's that's sort of a global statement. That's all data, not just photographic data. If you think about that, that's amazing. Uh, you know, we deal with gigabytes and terabytes now. And we're probably going to go to the next thing in the future. But And the files have gotten bigger. Obviously, the sensors have gotten bigger. And I'll use megapixel, megabyte interchangeably. We know that's not quite accurate. But uh, when digital cameras got to about two to four megabytes, I switched away from film because I thought the quality of the image was getting there. You could print that and have an image that you could compare to your photograph. Now most of us have 30, 40, 50 uh, megapixel cameras. Am I right there? Anybody have anything more than 50? I think we've kind of gotten to a plateau of uh, sensor sizes. I think now camera companies are doing different things. They're, they're deciding to get rid of stuff. So they're getting rid of the mirror. And of course, that means you have to buy all new lenses and they're making things lighter, but uh, the sensor hasn't jumped up in size. You know, we're kind of waiting for that next. And of course, the sensor size means the file size gets bigger, more to store, bigger images to open up on your editing program, whether that be Photoshop, Lightroom, or, or something else. And there's the, the metadata, it's not a big part of the file, but I'm amazed every time I look at my camera at the data that my camera stores at my ear. I've got an adapter I can plug in that now does GPS. And one of the guys on the trip with us had that. And at the end of the day, he could bring up the browser and show a map of where we were that day because the GPS coordinates would track our path. And it's just amazing, you know, daytime and all that stuff, but that's getting bigger too. And you know, when you edit a 50 megabyte image, what happens to the size of that image? But it usually gets bigger. Uh, and especially, I use Photoshop mostly. And when we add a layer and start doing things like that, uh, 
stuff gets even bigger. Now, I think library does too, but it's your catalog that gets bigger in library. Am I not mistaken? I think they call it catalog and library. We totally don't use Lightroom much, but I do use Adobe Camera Raw, which is the essentially it's the beginning of Lightroom. And if you take raw images for, and you open it in Photoshop, of course it takes you right to Adobe Camera Raw, and it really is a Lightroom uh, engine that drives those images. But so files get bigger when you edit them too, which means your storage has to get bigger. So that 1984 computer, here we are. Uh, Today, that's my desktop at home. The processor's huge. I got more hard drives than I can count. I've got 40 terabyte external hard drives. 40 terabyte. Uh, and they're fast connections. Uh, uh, USB 3 or Mac has a Thunderbolt, which is another connection that's uh, very, very fast. Uh, you tell I use Mac, by the way. I did go through a Windows phase, but then I sobered up. <laughs> and of course, now we got the photograph. We have the photos over here. Images are digital. Uh, we'll talk about the unlimited and free thing a little bit. Uh, we do have to talk about a budget, but that shutter on my camera, I can get seven frames a second on that shutter. That's kind of crazy. You just slip every once in a while and you end up with images you don't need. And my recent trip was a little over two weeks. I took 8,000 photographs. <laughs> So it doesn't take very many trips like that or Joe Packney or balloon festivals before we're dealing with hundreds of thousands of images. And you have to have a workflow or a pattern to save those. And it has to work because when something fails, when something breaks, and a lot of our hard drives now are spinning hard drives, they're SATA drives, they turn, they have mechanical parts, and they will break. So until we're all on an SSD system, which is a ways off, we need to be thinking a lot about, about backup. And of course, the darkroom's been replaced by the desktop. Uh, did you go backwards? I didn't. Okay. Uh, so storage should be something that you're comfortable with and needs to be a stable system. Uh, again, I'll say the topic's not real exciting, but it's key. Because you don't get the leopard picture five years from now if you're not doing your storage and archiving correctly now. As we said, hardware will fail and you have to be prepared for that. That uh, large terabyte drive that you have in an external closure that you're storing stuff on, it's going to fail at some point. So there has to be a backup or system for that or something that we'll, else we'll talk about, which is called RAID. We'll talk about RAID systems in a minute. Okay. Uh, how many of you store your photos on your computer or an adjacent drive so you can have immediate access to them? How many do that? Okay. So, any of you use a RAID type system for storage? Okay, a few. Okay, good. And do you back up your own photos to your hardware or do you use the cloud? How many cloud people do you have here? So, about half and half. A lot of you back up your stuff locally to your own device. And that, I'm in that group. This is kind of obvious, but we, we get our pictures on cards and I have several cameras, but unfortunately they all seem to have different cards. The versatile readers that read multiple cards are a great place to start to get your data onto the computer. I immediately put them in storage and I pull them over when I work on them. I do use a RAID system here. We'll talk about that again. For archive, and I use a RAID system. I'm not a big cloud fan, but it doesn't mean it's not a good thing. It's probably a lot of you know more about using cloud for backup than I do. Next. Next. I use terminology interchanging here, but we all know that we copy something. We're typically copying the image from the card. That's copy. Okay. Storage is when you put the image somewhere else. You can use your primary hard drive. Maybe your computer has a secondary hard drive or you're using an external drive or, or whatever. To me, archive is when you put something away and you're not connected to it. So archive doesn't have a cable or network. It's you put it up on the cloud. I'll show you another way to archive stuff with hard drives here in a minute. And I, I look at backup really as being more for the operating system of the programs. Although you can back up your photographic images. Now think about it, as your images get a little older, you're not accessing them frequently enough to merit backing them up. If you want to back up, you really just 
backing up the same thing that you're already backed up. So uh, I'll leave the word backup out in a lot of what we're talking about. You all understand that most of the time when we're backing up, we're backing up the operating system and the programs on our computer. Redundant array of independent disk array. And uh, RAID devices are basically little computers that take multiple drives, as few as two, and industrial wise, it could be dozens. But typically, the consumer will use a RAID system that has four or five hard drives. The RAID controller puts those together. So you look at that, and it looks like one hard drive, one big hard drive. And then you select the array, the RAID system that you want to use from zero to six. You're trying to achieve redundancy. So I'll just use the round number of 40 again, 40 terabytes. If you choose RAID zero for that 40 terabyte drive, it'll look like a 40 terabyte drive. There won't be any redundancy. Everything on there is vulnerable because it's all in the drives. But RAID 1 is really the best choice. And what RAID 1 does is it integrates all that. So when data goes out from your computer to the RAID drive, RAID puts it in different places. So it has happened to me a few months ago, one of my five hard drives failed in my RAID system. The RAID device sent me an email, so drive two is dead. And you panic a little bit, but then you realize I had a RAID system. Take the drive out. Slide the new drive in, it formats, and within a few seconds, you're back. Your data's there, you lost nothing, or you had to buy a new hard drive, but you're up and running. And most of the systems will allow up to two drive failures at a time. That doesn't occur. But uh, it's, it's a hot swap, you know, you don't have to turn the power off, take the bad drive out, and you know it's a bad one because it's got the red light instead of the green light. Put the new drive in. And then a few seconds, the green light's on and everything's there. So the RAID systems aren't cheap. I'll show you a couple in just a minute. But it is a long investment. If you think about a cloud account, what does a five terabyte cloud account cost per month? 20 bucks? Anybody? So yes, that's, that's a good round it up. Backup plays is like 0.005 a gigabyte or something like that. Okay. So, like, I that. so there's a cost to it. Maybe, maybe it's 10 bucks, maybe it's 50 bucks a month, depending on what data you have. But that cost recurs and it recurs the next year and the next year. Pretty soon, those free images aren't free anymore. And you're trying, you're starting to decide, well, am I going to save this? This one's a little blurry, delete. Oh, these are JPEGs. I'm not going to save those. I'm just going to save the raw images. So you get back to thinking like we used to, which is budgeting your space. So, uh, and of course you have to do that with RAID, but when you buy your RAID system, you own it. Uh, the first RAID system I bought was uh, five drives and they were one terabyte each, so five terabyte RAID drive. And the last one I bought is got five 10 terabyte drives. I'm, I'm sorry, five eight terabyte drives. So it's 40 terabytes. And it works just like the smaller one does. It's just more data. You set it on RAID 1, and I think I've used 20% of it. Right. That's the system that I mentioned where the drive failed and I hot swap. Okay, you, can you like take one drive right out and put a new one in and then put all your data? Um, it redistributes the data. That data that, that I lost on drive two, was copied, RAID had copied it on another drive. Right. So we put the new drive in, the RAID system just repopulates the failed new drive. Right. So and you don't really, I don't get into really knowing where the files are because they're there. You can just take one out and have it archived. No, because uh, the, the, yeah, when, you know, when files are broken up like that, yeah. it may not be the complete file. It may be packets. So, it needs to, it needs to go back in. You can't just pull it out and say, I'm going to put this away and put a new one there. Okay. But the thing to do with that is to, uh, once your ray drive gets full, just turn it off and put it away. Oh, okay. 
But with uh, the one that failed, it knew what had been, I mean, it knew what was missing. Right, did. Yeah, the, the controller knew. And that was duplicated that. somewhere else, so it knew to go and put that back as back. Du duplication. So it's not the same thing on all five. No, it's oh, no, 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 no. Spread no, out. But there are duplications, but not five duplications. Right. It's two or three, depending on the redundancy system that, that controller uses. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of brands in a minute, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those. But drive one doesn't have the same file in it that drive two, three, four, and five do. Their packets and the rating controller decides where to put those. And you just, it's kind of like the cloud, you have to trust it, but that's what you pay for. You pay for that controller to be able to do that. Most of the higher end RAID devices also have a solid state drive in them. Smaller one, usually it's like 512. So when your data is going into the RAID controller, rather than it putting the data into the uh, SATA drives, it puts it into this solid state drive and then that distributes it out. So it makes data transfer very fast. Okay. Interesting. We've talked about copy. Storage can be anywhere. You, you may use, you may not do enough photography to merit another hard drive. You may actually store your stuff on a sector of your main hard drive. You may have a second hard drive in your computer or an external drive, but either way that allows immediate access to your, to your photographs. I said earlier, when I said that archive, when, when you archive something, I think of it not being connected to the computer. We'll talk about how to do that in just a minute. Back up. We, talked about that already so next slide please okay storage devices need to be stable they can be one of two types we've talked about the SATA type drives those are the spinning drives that have parts that break and the solid state drives are coming along they're getting bigger their price is coming down a little but you still can't buy a 10 terabyte solid state drive at least we can't and uh when they have them out, they'll be much more expensive than the uh, SATA type drives. But that's catching up. And the nice thing about the solid state drive, of course, is there's no moving parts. Theoretically, they should not fail. They should. Somebody here probably has a bad solid state story, but, uh, <laughs> but still, compared to the hard drive and the moving parts, the solid state drive is very, very stable. And they need to be cost effective. And uh, for me, I separate these files from my workstation. I have a network device. That my RAID is hooked up on the network. I have it in another room in the house. It's on a different circuit breaker. It's got its own APS backup or battery backup surge protector system. Because it makes no sense to have all the stuff and have it sitting right next to your computer plugged into the same outlet. Uh, the risk is there, obviously, for both of them to get zapped. A few months ago, I wouldn't have had the Western Digital device up here. I just had Drobo, and I would sound like a Drobo salesperson because that's the brand that I've used and I have a few of them. That they work great. Something so happened to uh, Drobo. Drobo, D R O B O. These are the rate, these are the rate controllers, and they make many different ones. And these are the consumer type ones. Uh, a few months ago, sort of at the middle or latter part of COVID. Drobo kind of disappeared. They, uh, they had trouble getting their controller chips. There was a backlog, the, the same thing that affected cars. And they're coming back, but I'm not gonna buy one until I've done a little more homework. So recently, the last controller I bought, I bought a Western Digital, and it, it's great. So there weren't a lot of these to choose from a few years ago. There's Drobo, and then you started to get into the industrial stuff, which is big. And, had fans and cost a lot of money. These are still affordable. Uh, this has got four 10 terabyte hard drives. This was $1,800. And the other drive I have here has got five eight terabyte hard drives. And I think it was $1,500 when I got it. And the price is directly affected by the size of the hard drive you put in there and the quality of the hard drive. Uh, Western Digital sells many different hard drives, not just size, but also quality. Uh, their high-end drive is a black drive. That's the uh, one that's for mission critical sort of things that can't fail. Then there's several others down to red or blue or something. And there's about a two-fold difference in the price. So it sort of comes to your decision, what do you want to put in there? Maybe somewhere in the middle of the, of the road. We'll talk about that again in a second, but 
I think the Western Digital System is one that, if you're thinking about array controller, you should you should look at that. Here's a way that I archive stuff. Uh, there are a lot of these different external things that you can plug hard drives into. This is made by Voyager. There are some that are just plugs that plug into the bottom of the hard drive and get the drive power and connectivity through a USB. I go out and buy inexpensive hard drives, the, the red version of the Western Digital. This connects to the uh, computer through a USB. And you plug your hard drive in it just like you would your SD card. And the icon pop, pops up on your screen and you have a, whatever this is. If this is an eight terabyte hard drive, you have an eight terabyte folder on your computer. You dump your data in there. And once it's done doing its thing, you can take that drive out, put it away. I put it back in the static free bag, put a little note on there about what trip or what images there were. And that's free. I mean, you bought the drive. You don't have to pay to store it. They're not images that you're going to be connecting to every day where you're going to, you know, oh, I need to pull that drive out and get that image. These are things that you're pretty much done with. You don't want to get rid of them, of course, but you want to have them in some sort of archive manner. So these devices are out there. Again, this is a Voyager. Uh, they're not real fast, but they work well. And so when you go to too. Once that has one slot, one hard drive slot. I've got two slots. The other one has two, two drives in there and copy. And inside the drive, if you look in, it looks just like the reverse of the hard drive. There's a power slot, and then there's the IDE plug for the SATA drive, and it just plugs right in there. So this is an option for archiving uh, that works and that you can do on your own. And it's uh, and again, you don't have to get the high-end drive because this drive isn't going to be running a lot. You're going to plug it in, it spins up, you copy to it, when you're done, you unplug it, and it just sits there and it keeps. Where are you buying your drive? Online? Uh, B and H okay. I buy all my stuff there. It's, I, I priced around a little bit on some things, but I tried to buy a television locally recently. Went and looked at it, got the price. B and H delivered it, UPS put it in my living room. And I save two hundred dollars. It's it's really I mean you want to do business locally, but it's hard to. Uh, of course, you're not paying taxes, and they say the shipping is free. But I didn't have to load it up in my truck. I didn't have to drag it in. I came home and it was sitting in the living room. Uh, so uh, shop around, but uh, B and H. So failure is more dependent on wear and tear and use duration time time. Yes. So storing something like that isn't going to Cause the moving problem. parts aren't moving as long okay. as you have it in a dust air free area okay. in that static bag and it's dry. That drive should spin up the next time you put it in. And technology has slowed to a point at which you'll be able to retrieve that in the future. Yeah, the controller plugs okay. standardized unless they get to the point where they're not using IDE controllers, but I don't really see. Okay, that's the controller where it plugs directly into the motherboard. They would have to change. Uh, the world would have to come to an end and have to redesign the first to get rid of that. They make one for the solid state drive, and it's a little clip on, and it just fits on the solid state drive, solid state drive, and it would pop up as an icon too. But this is actually a clunker. These things are designed for hard drives. If you've got a solid state drive, it probably came with an adapter plug. You can probably plug that into your USB 3 or to your Thunderbolt or something, and it's going to be a lot more performance, a lot faster, but you're also paying more for the storage. Yeah. You know, it's more expensive than the, uh, and I show this because this is sort of a cheaper way to go. It's more cost effective. I kind of avoided backup because that involves software. And then we get into everything about what software do you use for your backup. Uh, years ago, I started using a software made by a company called Acronis. And I've stuck with it and I, it's, the system works well. There's a very little user curve when you start using it. Uh, you pay an annual fee, but that fee is sort of like insurance because if you ever have anything crash or you need to restore some data from a store drive, they'll get on the phone with you and walk you through. So that 49 a year or whatever is essentially like an insurance policy so they can help you out if you ever have to restore from a backup. 
And again, we're talking mostly about operating systems and programs, although this can apply to your photos. I think the copy paste and the external storage is easier to do. And this has a connection to the cloud. So you can actually use the Acrona system and back your stuff up to the cloud. And you may have other stuff like your business files or your family or personal stuff that you want to back up. You can set that up as multiple backups and have it actually be separate. And Acrona is really good about that. So is that all that you have to set up on a schedule? Yeah, a little green light up on my computer. And if it doesn't get a backup, it turns red and it tells me why that backup didn't go through. <coughs> We haven't talked about this, but a lot of the hard drives have longevity because we have sleep systems. We have methods to put those drives to sleep. Most of them have a feature called wake on land, meaning that if there's a local area network connection to that drive, it'll wake up. Uh, that's important because if you're backing up to a drive and it's asleep, your backup system is going to say, I can't find the drive. As long as it has that wake on land feature with the drive will perk up and something within your local network, which obviously is free of a password, tries to connect to that, then it spins up and your data can transfer and back up. Okay, go back one. Go back one slide, guys. Okay, your turn. I have several comments for that. Please. Very good talk. Uh, 1996, the worldwide production of hard drives was 16 terabytes. So you have three times, almost three times <laughs> yeah. of the worldwide production. Uh, my background is in high performance computing, but I've been retired for 10 years, so I'm a little familiar with this. Uh, for a hobbyist, one thing you can do is call the 3 to one rule. Three drives, two locally, one stored remotely. If you're running a Mac, they have software called Time Machine that you can set up to use multiple drives. You have to Google it, see how it's not the default. And what I personally do, I keep one drive locally and it automatically backs it up and then I unmap the drive once a week, swap it with one in the storage shed. Once a month, I retrieve the third one from the safe deposit box and put it in the mix with the others. And that seems to work pretty well. If I were running a business, I might do something differently. I might use a cloud for one of those storages. And I might consider backup to tape, LTO tape. This is a commercial thing, but you're running a business, right? Because I want to make real sure. I've got those images to keep some angry bride seller from coming after me. <laughs> so that's it. Perfect. Three, two, one. Uh, anybody else do anything different? Or? Well, so this is, again, kind of business life. But I've got, so the latest attached storage device we have is uh, eight drives, and I just upgraded them to six terabytes. So okay. Terabytes. Wow. Good. I've got two other ones, the older ones that were four drives, and each one of those is 24 or 32 terabytes. That's the older stuff from a few years ago. We'll, we'll fill that up in for two years. So right. a couple things I recommend. One, because like you said, memory, it just gets cheaper every year. Like, so I start with what I need, and then when those drives get full, because of the RAID system, you can swap them out. So I start out with four terabyte and then when I need now I'm up to the six they cost the six terabytes cost as much as the two or four terabytes did a few years ago. <clears throat> um, we had failures so I will tell you this multiple the most catastrophic ones are because of the firmware mm -hmm. in the little computer yeah. systems. So one of them the firmware went bad and it was all there. The data was all there but we couldn't get to it. It was like the drive was blank. And we were down for almost a week because of that while we figured it out. So always update your firmware when yeah. it tells you to update it. And then last year we got hacked by somebody trying to get that phone. And the only thing that saved us, I think, is that that 32 terabyte at that time had about 25 terabytes of stuff on it. 
And the stuff they started encrypting was stuff that I didn't really need anymore because it was backed up. So I didn't have to pay the Bitcoin ransom or whatever. But the reason why they got in was because of the firmware on the system. Mm -hmm. And again, update your firmware. And the firmware that well, we're talking about is. Wayne Harris is saying that they hacked exactly the wrong part. Yeah, they just okay. picked the wrong part. We got lucky. And the yeah. firmware is the software that's on the rate device, by the way. It's uh, just, uh, just so everybody, yeah. everybody knows it's the part of the software that runs in the rate controller. But just keep that updated. Set it to automatically update. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, for for hobbyists, you also use an online storage system called Ventolio. Are you they, they do a nice, you can do a nice website from it, but um, and we only data back up our raw files for particular projects, but we pay for 389 gigabytes, we pay $32 for the and that's just the EMG, that's not. No, those are just the JPEG. No, that's, oh, that's, that's, that's the raw file. So that's the raw, so that's the raw, that's the raw file. Well, a lot of places won't allow you to store a DMG or a raw file, like a photo filter, or so, and maybe they do now, but where, can you, can you store your DMGs on a cloud store so you can access? I don't or, use the cloud, I'd have to ask the cloud people here. Yeah, that's a question I have. Because that's, that's a good thing, if you don't want to do all the great stuff and just want it elsewhere, a company like Infolio is not that expensive, and you have your DMG. That's for $32 a month? Um, that's, yeah, that's just for the raw storage. You can buy different plans, like we have pro plans that can go and deliver all our images to our clients. But um, and so it's, it's based on storage. So that's over 400 gigabytes of DMGs. So, you know, depending on what you want to put on there. But for client files, like when you're talking about price, people who want to come, people will come back four or five years from now and use that, that DMG. And if it's on a hard drive, it fails. Anybody use the cloud that backs up raw files to their cloud account? Yeah. Okay. Matt, no problem with that? I use a um, uh, service called iDrive. iDrive, so okay. I store it, but then we turn it on here. Uh, I'm approaching five terabytes. Okay. And less than $100 a year. Wow. But what I found interesting about iDrive is because you don't want to have to open those five terabytes. Once a year, they will send you a hard drive, whatever size mm -hmm. you want. You can copy all your stuff to that hard drive, mail it back to them, and they will put it on your online account. That's nice. Nice. Yeah. 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 That's called iDrive? iDrive. So I had a question for you, going back to what you were saying earlier. Do you when you come home with your raw files, do you convert them to a DMG and do the DMG format? No, the they're in uh, Nikon. they're the Nikon is in uh, in yeah. NES. Yeah. NES. And so I what we found in working with those files, and a lot of times a typical photographer will you know come home with uh, a thousand files, a thousand files a day, or you know, a thousand images a day, or times you know, seven stars. Um, if you convert them to that Adobe DMG, which Adobe has said they will always support, um, we find that the, the, the editing of them actually goes a little faster too. What happens to the file size? What happens to, to the file we, size? We work in Lightroom, so this is really good. Okay, yeah, but your catalog. Oh, our catalog will grow less. It's yeah. smaller than the DMG. <laughs> okay, and that's what I was getting to, is that yeah. your catalog will grow less. Yeah, the catalog grows less, the images are quicker to work with in Adobe programs. Um, I know for a fact Lightroom, and I think, I'm, I'm imagining Photoshop as well. Um, well, and once you print it in the DMGs, the whole thing is supported by Adobe, so you have okay. to do it all. Yeah. So if Nikon decides to come out with an NES 2 in the future, and Adobe might stop supporting the original NES file. I got you. And you might not be able to open it in Adobe programs anymore. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. But Adobe's well, Adobe's kept true with the PDF. You know, the PDF when they first came out with it, that was going to be the document forever. Yeah. And now it's you just don't say things to the PDF. The software comes with an editor. You can yeah. edit and create PDF files. Not as easy as you can a text-based file, but you can still update a PDF if you need to, and then save it as a small PDF file for somebody to upload. What's nice about the format that Adobe has made that available. Format available. You open it. So even if Adobe goes away, yeah, 
formats there. It's not proprietary. Anybody else have any backup or storage stories to tell? That's what I use. And you can set it to back up continuously, or you can set a time too. So you can have it back up from midnight to 6 a.m. That's what I use. I run, I run my backups at night too. Back to leave. The kid mentioned it at his talk, and I, it's really good. That's what the heart They'll send you an external block with everything. Yeah, nice. Sounds like all of these companies are doing similar things. I didn't list them because I knew you all just have experiences on the chair. Kind of all completely does the system. I use Lightroom, but I import images. They go to an external hard drive catalog, but I click the box that says um, store images on the second drive. So I store those on my internal hard drive on the Apple on the computer on the Mac. I've got a time machine, which then backs up the Mac. As well as my current hard drive, which is Lightroom, that backs up to an external hard drive and my Drobo. So I've got those two for the pictures that I can see that I recently imported. About every three or four months, I'm going to about clear that out from my main hard drive before it doesn't get loaded. I've got external hard drives that I use for my, <coughs> excuse me, for my uh, catalog. And every two or three months, I use good sync on my computer to duplicate my external hard drive. So I have two external hard drives just like that. I also use Backblaze, which backs up your main computer, and every hard drive you have connected to that computer. So Backblaze is backing up all those as well. So I've got my recent three to four months worth of pictures on my internal hard drive. Got them on an external hard drive, which is backed up to the second external hard drive. And that hard drive is also backed up to Backblaze. So See, we all have a workflow. It's a little different. We all do things a little different, different products, but we all have a system where we have access to our images. We have them saved somewhere where, where they can be saved. I didn't say anything about the battery backup systems, but all your main devices should be plugged into a, a surge protector battery type system. APS is the best known, uh, but they should be plugged in there. And I actually have my setup. APC, 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 thank you. Uh, you know, the worst part of power for products is not the surges. I don't know how long it was brown, brown out we have. And my unit was deep, maybe once or twice a day, and it's just because the voltage was low. So I've got a couple, and I have things like my router, uh, my internet router that comes in the house, because every time that thing blinks, you lose your connection, so you know, it starts back up. So I have that plugged in. So even the power blinks, so there's some brown out. You don't have to wait for that connection to reset. But those things are really important. Even if you don't use a battery backup, make sure you have one that's got really good surge protection. Because, uh, and the whole house surge protection is nice, but the last damage that I had in my home from lightning came through the fence into the laundry room, into the dryer. So if your computer's anywhere near a window, which it probably is, uh, you still want to have uh, some protection there at the device. The whole house surge is nice, but uh, if you have a local strike or some major <laughs> static event or something, uh, the whole house thing isn't going to help you. Do you recommend a battery backup that lasts for a number of hours? Because I have issues with that. Like the old days, I would be redoing all the lines in my neighborhood and everything. And it would be nice to have something where it's not just up when I look into it. It seems like some of them only do half an hour, 45 yeah, minutes. Yeah, that's it. I mean, if you have a storm come through and your power's out for an entire day, then that's it. For something in the hobbyist, uh, prosumer sort of price range, you're not going to get anything with much more than an hour. You have to find industrials type thing to do that. And then you're 
probably better to invest in a there generator or something. Are, I don't know if any of the cell, I don't know any that uses the sale fee for really long duration. I think my biggest APC that I have, maybe I get 45 minutes. The main thing I'm concerned about are those brownouts, those dips and voltage that causes damage to your electronic, just like the surge does. And you don't always see the brownouts because unless the light's dim, you don't know that your voltage just dropped to 90 for a few seconds. Now the computer, the computer knows it, it feels that, but uh, anyhow. I think the other idea with it is just to give you enough time to shut stuff down. Right, so to cool. save your application you're working it's on. It's really hard on this to crash. Yeah, because you're if you've got a photo image open and you're not doing a regular sort of save, you either through the software or manually, you can have an hour or two into something and lose it. So that's the big deal there is it gives you a chance to close down it controlled manner. So, uh, okay, next slide. I went on a trip recently. Uh, the outfitter was Natural Habitat, NatHab, and I've been with others and I've been with NatHab before. And they're, they're great. Uh, they're affiliated with World Wildlife, but I'm not sure how. I think it's just that they donate to each other or whatever, but it makes the trips really good. The, uh, guides are, are uh, college or master's level trained and whatever they're talking about. The lady that took us to the Galapagos Center to see the turtles had done her thesis on turtle hatching or something. So they're very eco-friendly, eco-knowledgeable. They make that aspect of the trip. Plus they take pictures so they know what you're after. There's only 12 in our group. We're on a huge boat with 12 crew. So, you know, so plenty of space. Our room was huge. Uh, we didn't spend any time there, but it was huge. Great food. Uh, Sometime down the road, I'll send you all a link to YouTube. My wife does video and I do still images. She'll make a little production. Uh, when uh, Dick and I and Harry Purcell went to Brooks Falls in Alaska, no relation, but I, I tried to go in there and say, hey, I'm Tim Brooks. <laughs> they still don't give me a discount. But uh, my wife made a movie called Tim, Dick and Harry. And it's on YouTube and it's basically, it's, a photo, it's photographs, but she made it into a movie with music. Uh, so she she likes to make do video things. She does a really nice job. Yeah. So this trip was uh, to Ecuador to get to the Galapagos Islands, and we went to Peru, mostly to get to Machu Picchu. But we did some rural things in Peru, and I like to share you a few, a few pictures. But these are boobies. Anything with the word booby in it is cool. <laughs> but these are blue-footed boobies. We actually saw the red-footed booby also. They're actually blue all the way up to here, but the image covers them. And this is a male, and he's doing the sky dance. It's called the sky dance. And you can see the female looks really impressed. I don't, I don't know what movies look like when they're impressed. But uh, so these are unique to the Galapagos Islands, of blue-footed movies. There's a blue eye. <laughs> what? Next. We have cormorants around here. Y'all see them, they're big, big winged birds, they fly around. Well, evolution has affected cormorant on Galapagos. They don't have any wings, little tiny wings. They're now flightless birds and they dive in the water. And when you're out diving, historically, every once in a while, you see a black flash, the bayou, and it's the flightless cormorant. So that's part of, uh, you know, Darwin wrote most of his stuff about finches. He studied all the different finches and their different beaks, the different food, and that was really where a lot of his theory of uh, evolution came from, the finches. But this is a classic, another great example of a, a bird didn't need its wings, so it just, they just atrophy. And uh, anyhow, they're doing well. There's a lot of them around. Um, his eye, too, is built for underwater. You can see with the blue, mm -hmm. that's probably a reflection. He's probably got a, like a, connected, some sort of a covering. They had a lot of fish in the mouth when I saw them. <laughs> and I met Mr. Darwin. He said to say hello. <laughs> <laughs> Which one's about? <laughs> <laughs> see, I don't have the full beard. So this is me. You also tell it's COVID times, so I have the chin strap. But he said to say hello. And the Galapagos is mostly about sea life and, and birds, but uh, of course the flamingo. 
They have flamingos in the golf course? That's cool. This is the male frigate bird doing its blow up thing to show off to the, to the female. We're jumping to Peru. This is Machu Picchu. We were there two days. A little rainy the first day, but of course we got some beautiful rainbows. And the next day it was really gorgeous. There are a lot of people there. I have full pictures of Machu Picchu with no one in the image. You were there in the middle of the week. So, but uh, the short answer is no, no lines, got on the bus. We took the bus up to the space and there were just the four of us on the bus. Yeah. Our guy, five of us, the two couples and a guy, and that was it on the bus. Came back to leave, got right on the bus, no lines. But I can see how you can be there and it would be a nightmare. But we were able to climb and hike and occasionally we'd pass somebody and say hello, but it was, uh, we picked a good time. But I, you can expect there would be crowds there. I heard it was getting crowded. Yeah. Did you have the same outfit? Yeah, in fact, they just handed us off to the Peru Mad Hat, and they had a trip to the Amazon, Galapagos and Peru. And we did Galapagos and Peru, but there were people with us who had been on all three. Well, a couple with us that went to Peru, because only four of us somewhere in the Peru left, but they had been to Amazon. They'd been gone two months. But there are people that travel like that. <clears throat> So you all probably thinking that I got my Antarctic pictures mixed up with my Galapagos pictures. But there is a penguin in the Galapagos Islands and it probably migrated down there millions of years ago when the Galapagos Islands one probably came from the tip of South America. Uh, of course, it's standing there on, on lava, which kind of give, gives it away. But they're everywhere and there are a lot of them. And there's the other next picture of a whole bunch of them. And a group of penguins is a waddle. I had to look that up. It's a waddle. So there's a waddle of penguins. And then we have, I think we have some sea lions next. No, we have people. I, I don't take people a lot. I know uh, Harry Purcell, who I, you know, he goes to travels to places to photograph people. And uh, so I go to photographs the wildlife. Uh, this is a Peruvian woman. Their hats are indicative of the region they're from. They start having families very young. We saw a wedding in a square in one of the little towns we were in. I think they had to be 15 people get married. Of course, their life expectancy is shorter. Uh, you'll see a young woman with a child on the back. And of course, she's weaving. And that's a big, uh, big thing over there is uh, making sort of classic weaving. <coughs> oh, good. We got to see this. The uh, ocean iguanas, the sea iguanas are everywhere. They're, this is probably the neatest evolved animal. If you took a, a land iguana and put it in the water, it would probably die in, in the salt water because it, it couldn't get rid of all the salt. These animals have adapted a mechanism to get the salt out of their nose. And every once in a while, they'll just sneeze at you. And the mucusy white stuff will come out and that's expelling the extra salt that they get because they eat the algae from the bottom of the ocean. So they're consuming huge amounts of salt, but they're, uh, they're everywhere. And they're, they're very friendly. Uh, they're, they're very ugly too, yeah. That's why I got three of them in the picture. How do they pay? <laughs> well, okay, let's talk about food. Uh, we were in a little city in Peru, and the little huts had flags out, those little plastic flags hanging out. And the guy said, What are the flags mean? So it means the beer is ready. So for forever, these people have made their own beer out of corn. And it's a low alcohol containing stuff that looks like crap and you wouldn't drink it. But it's one of their major ways to consume carbohydrate is to eat this locally made only cerveza beer. Uh, so he arranged for a woman to take us into the little hut and show us her beer. Process. So we go in there, you know, I, I'm like this because it's four feet. Pretty <laughs> people are short. But anyway, we sit down and she's showing us the corn and the different steps and translating it. And I'm looking down on the floor. Fireball. So I was just being one of my floaters, you know. So it goes flying by. Then a few minutes later, she takes a tray of the corn mash and puts it down on the floor. Guinea pigs. Oh. <laughs> That's their protein source. So we some of the nice restaurants had grilled guinea pig on the menu. I didn't try it. I, 
I had neutrino before. I figured nothing worse than neutrino. I just passed on the guinea pig, but that's their protein source, guinea pig. Uh, the fun thing about the seals is watching, sealants, excuse me, is watching them. Their interactions are great. They don't argue, they don't talk politics, they don't riot, they don't burn. They're just friendly. And they play with you in the water too. That would be on Donna's video. They even liked our deck. This is our deck down our window. And I went down a little while and talked to them. And, uh, and, uh, uh -huh. said, hello. Now, this next picture, I want you all to tell me what this is. Okay. No, close. There's only a few thousand of them in the wild. It's called the spectacle bear. Uh, the resort, the resort the hotel we stayed at, the base of Machu Picchu, had a couple of areas behind them where they are rescuing, rehabilitating, releasing these bears. They've done really well. In fact, they have some tags on some females they've released in their cubs. So the process is doing really well. This bear came from a Moscow zoo where she was forced to wear a tutu and dance while being shocked. So they rescued her. She took a long time to rehabilitate. She was sick. But now she's a little overweight. Uh, they released her and she went away for a couple of weeks and came back. <laughs> then they released her a few more times and either way she came back. So they now have a permanent enclosure back there for people who can't go on a two-week hike to try to see one in the wild. You can go visit her. They feed her in the morning. The guy takes you down there and tells you more than you want to know about spectacle bears. What's this distortion in your the fence? Yeah, yeah, so I've tried to, I'm working on that, but I'm not not good, I'm too much. Like yeah, you know, we we went out, or I went out, the guy it was just the two of us. We go for feeding. So they're out there, they're out of their cave, they're friendly, they're walking around. You can get a reasonable shot. But uh, the next enclosure behind hers is electronic enclosure, no fence. So the bears that come in now go into the electronic enclosure. They don't feed them very much, they make them forage. Then when they're healthy and they've had their antibiotics and they're doing better, they turn the fence off and release them. So the process of rehabilitate or rescue, rehabilitate, and release, they're learning. Nobody's ever tried to do that with spectacle bear before. But uh, they've let about 10 go. And have what size are they? It on. It's like a black bear, two or 300 pounds. And she's the chubby. She's been eating a lot of Mango. Well, she, she, well, she doesn't now, that's for sure. And she just realized, in the, and what they, they eat in the wild, they eat plants, bark, and they eat, they love vermiliads. Uh, uh, climbing up a tree to get a vermiliad, or walking up to the back and having a tray of fruit. <laughs> Most people figure that out pretty quickly. But uh, so I think they said there were 4,000 in the wild. So it's a pretty pretty rare animal, but it's kind of neat to be able to see it and not have to hike in the jungle for two years to see it. Unless there's a few shots of uh, that, of course, I'll use my backup and save ability to keep those. So in a year or two, when I have time, I can go in there and yeah. 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 edit a few images. I'm sure you'll have time, right? Yeah. Uh, probably. I still have a, a week of Africa images that I haven't, haven't looked at. It just happens that you get busy planning the next trip. And then my wife hasn't touched our video yet, but she's already talking to the outfitter about Borneo. And, and that stuff. Okay, so whenever you want pictures for a video, will you give us the links? To I will. In fact, she's working now on making a master list of all the YouTube videos. Okay. And send that out so you can see Tim, Dick, and Harry. You can see a couple of trips to Africa, India, Utah. Utah yeah. Does she have her own channel? No, I. My wife is really creative, but she's not super computer savvy. So she just puts them up there and they're scattered. But I, I've talked to her about that and about getting them all. In fact, she's got two or three usernames, so they're. <laughs> <laughs> she does know how to make the URL a tiny URL, send that out to all the friends. Uh, but uh, the, uh, I think the India video has been the most viewed. It's got some pretty spectacular video of big tigers and uh, that's we also did a thing in Africa one time where we went to a rehab place that has 
Well, they had at the time three young cheetahs that they had uh, brought them up because the mom was never found. Right? She was killed or poached or whatever. And they're about ready to be released. In fact, they let them go and hunt some. But you go there and the caption of the trip is walking with cheetahs. So you go into this reserve, you sign a release and they hand you the leash. And the cheetahs take you on a tour around. It was pretty dramatic. It's, they purr and they lick you. And, and it's like having about a, a 80 pound cat. But uh, walking with cheetahs is another video. You have it, uh, but they tell you not to run, right? Whatever uh, you do, don't run. Yeah, they're uh, <laughs> they're pretty much they're walking you. Uh, they, you've got a belt on, so they can't. They go away. They're dragging you. <laughs> but, it's, uh, but there, there's other places you'll we'll see other places. The next time we'll probably have a line we'll walking the lines. Uh, but of course, they're releasing them. They get paid by the government to do that. They have a good track record. They have cats that are out there that probably are reproducing. So. The, recovery and release system is uh, it's working in a lot of places. Anybody got any other thoughts? Thank you. Thank you. Let me see if there's questions here. I invested in a uh, two terabyte passport Hard drive is built in a shock resistant case. So you can drop it and theoretically it works. And I, when I get back to the room or the tent or wherever it's at night, first thing I do is back up to the drive. I haven't exceeded it yet, but a couple of times I think it's okay. But I think it's shock resistant, water, not waterproof, but water resistant enclosure. And it's uh, Plug it into the card reader. Yeah. Yeah, shockproof is essential because I have a drop from the drive. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, they're not that much more expensive than just a drop, but it's uh, having that shock resistance. Mm -hmm. We also use Wolverines to feed seed, so we'll shoot with the Wolverine on location to feed the seed images so that you're getting that are a little bit better than what's inside of the camera, and then we mail that. I'd like to see that. I had a little Epson device for many years. So you put your SD card in, and you can scroll through the images right there on the little viewer. Yeah, you and can take it. So that's what will take with us to Africa is, is one of those. So we can have it in the vehicle without having a computer. Right, or so doing the camera. Dump, you yeah. can dump and go. And then if you run out of the hard space, then you can have a seed card. So Wolverine is like the Epson card? It's uh, has a screen on it? Yeah, it has a screen and it has multiple ports. And I mean, I just was looking, like, if you were to get one now, you could get 100, 100 gig of bleed. Okay. Um, so it's it's not a terabyte, but it'll, you can get it'll, get, it'll get you a day. Yeah. Okay, it'll, get, it'll, it'll get a day worth of images if you're going to be out for 12, 15 hours on your rig valve. A lot of, a lot of yeah, these I, I, I was just looking, I'm like, yeah, I'm terabyte one now. Yeah, a lot of these trips are two weeks and you're there there to get your entire self and photograph so when you start planning on archiving your images during the trip you got to think about cross space so it's uh you know the, the afternoon at joe patty you can upload that pretty quickly but some of these trips you know there's so much shade you have to keep thinking adding zero to predictions thank you thank you they say thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I am working on another talk, but.